The protagonist of our story is basically one of the greatest people to ever exist. Seriously, he's good at everything. Like, literally everything. He's a teacher, an astronaut, a delivery driver, a plumber, you name it. And it's not because of some mysterious woman behind his success. Nope. It's actually an AI bot from 2082 stuck in his head, helping him nail all these jobs like a pro. But what makes this story even more interesting is that the protagonist doesn't have a clue who he is, why he's here, or what he's supposed to be doing, and the AI in his head is just as clueless as him. All they know is that he is a special agent from some top-secret underground agency. So now his main mission in life is to uncover clues about himself and figure out where he fits into this crazy world. On his journey, you'll find him taking on all sorts of odd jobs just to make ends meet, like becoming a rope master to rescue damsels in distress, or becoming seasoned chef and tackling whatever bizarre task you can imagine. So, let's find out how this story began. The city is buzzing with its usual hustle and bustle. Everything seems to be running smoothly, except for the traffic signals, which might be short-circuiting. But that's not the only odd thing happening here. We meet a boy who has just come back to his senses, completely disoriented. He has no idea where he is, who he is, or even his own name. The only clue he has is the emblem of some special forces on the military uniform he's wearing. He knows it's a military outfit, but he can't figure out why he's rocking a military uniform. Suddenly, he hears a strange sound. Before he knows it, his body seems to take over on its own. He balls up his fist and delivers a devastating punch to a nearby tree, sending it crashing down with just one hit. Onlookers watch in shock, their eyes nearly popping out of their heads at the sheer force of his punch. As for the man himself, he has no clue either what just happened. He heard something in his right ear, and he just moved instinctively toward the source of the sound. That's when a voice suddenly speaks up, greeting him as if they've known each other forever. Of course, he looks around, trying to spot who's talking, but the voice quickly explains it's a body-integrated combat support AI. At the mention of body-integrated, the boy perks up, his curiosity piqued. The system confirms again that it's embedded directly in his body. He glances around, still bewildered, and asks the AI where he is and what year it is. The AI scans his surroundings, and promptly responds that based on the banner in his field of view, they're likely in Seoul and the year is 2024. The system then introduces itself, stating it's a military combat support AI from 2082. Naturally, the boy finds this ridiculous and immediately questions the system, asking if he's some kind of human from the future, sent back in time. The AI tries to access its operational records to answer, but it turns out it can't retrieve that information. Just as the mysterious man from the future is deep in conversation with his equally mysterious AI, the traffic signals around him finally give up. Their circuits burned out. A truck driver is just chilling down the road, but when he notices the dead signal, he starts to panic and slams on the brakes as hard as he can. Meanwhile, a red car is barreling towards the truck at breakneck speed, heading straight for a collision. Realizing he can't stop in time, the red car driver swerves onto the pedestrian sidewalk, heading straight towards our boy. Just as it looks like the car is about to crash into him, the AI quickly detects the impending accident and urgently instructs him to dodge. As the red car finally crashes into the side barrier, a metal rod is propelled out with bullet-like speed, heading straight for our boy. He ducks just in time, narrowly avoiding the rod. Unfortunately, it pierces a man standing behind him, impaling him through the stomach. The man lets out a cry of pain as the metal rod drives through him, and people around the scene quickly gather, tending to the injured. The AI system detects the casualty and assesses the situation. Meanwhile, our boy is rubbing his eyes, disoriented, and muttering about the red and blue lights he just saw. The AI responds and explains that the lights were part of an image projected by the visual assistance device functioning like an AR lens. Thanks to that projection, he managed to dodge the rod just in time. Even though he saved himself from that rod, the bad news is that the civilian who took the rod is likely to die within five minutes, and our boy is not sure if they can even get this man to the emergency room within that time. That's when the AI system suggests performing emergency field surgery right there on the spot. Naturally, the boy panics, insisting he can't do it but the system firmly reminds him that he can. First, though, they need to check the patient's condition. Despite having a thousand questions for the AI, the boy knows saving the injured man takes priority. So he quickly approaches, crouching down beside the man. The wound is deep, and he can tell this will be a major procedure. Hesitantly, he asks the system if they can really pull this off. The AI responds confidently, saying it's already identified the tools they need. A needle, thread, a small knife, and antiseptic. That should be enough for the surgery. The boy mutters these items out loud, catching the attention of a man sitting nearby. The man asks our boy if he actually knows any first aid procedure. If yes, the man also volunteers to help. Grateful for the assistance, 
the boy instructs him to gather the necessary items. After a few moments of asking the crowd for help, they manage to collect everything they need, thanks to the cooperation of the onlookers. The onlookers look dubious and nervous about a boy performing surgery, especially since he doesn't look like a doctor at all. They worry that a rough procedure could lead to infection or worse. The tension in the air is thick, and it's starting to weigh heavily on our boy. He quietly asks the AI what the next step is now that they have all the required tools. The AI tells him that if he grants it temporary control, it can guide his hands to perform the surgery. Well, our boy would love to know what that even means. However, with the patient's life hanging in the balance, he does not have time to ask any questions, so he reluctantly agrees. As soon as he does, a blue light begins to shimmer around him, and his hands start moving on their own. They work quickly and precisely. Before long, he's stitching up the patient's wound, his movements perfectly coordinated by the AI. Suddenly, a red warning alert flashes in his vision, indicating that blood loss has exceeded expected levels and the survival probability has decreased. This news shocks him, and he urgently asks the AI if they can really save the man. Unfortunately, the AI doesn't respond, and his hands suddenly stop moving. In a moment of panic, he makes a clumsy stitch, causing the patient's wound to start oozing blood. The guy is left looking clueless after making this clumsy mistake, and he is sure that he is screwed now. The scene shifts to a hospital, buzzing with activity around the critical patient who has lost too much blood and needs immediate surgery. After a long and intense operation, the lead surgeon finally emerges from the operating room. The assistant doctor asks about the patient's condition. The surgeon proudly announces that the patient survived. The assistant doctor is relieved to hear this and curiously asks if the injury was not as severed as it seemed. The surgeon explains that the condition was actually quite serious, but the bleeding of the wound had already been controlled by some unknown person. That unknown person had used regular thread for stitching and managed to suture both the inside and outside of the wound. If it hadn't been for that intervention, the patient would have likely died even before arriving at the hospital. The doctor is utterly blown away by the fact that someone used regular sewing thread to stitch the wound. The surgeon then reveals even more unsettling news that the stitches were as uniform and consistent as if done with a sewing machine. Despite the surgeon's insistence that this is the truth, the doctor finds it hard to believe. Just then, a new figure enters the scene, who introduces himself as Detective Park Gijon, and immediately inquires about the patient's condition. The doctor informs him that the patient is stable, and they quickly asks the detective if it's true that someone performs surgery on the streets. The detective confirms this, adding that he heard the person was shouting for a scalpel and ended up using a box cutter for the procedure. This revelation shocks both doctors even further. The detective, who does not really understand anything about surgery, curiously asks if it's really possible to perform surgery under such conditions. The surgeon quickly shouts that it's definitely impossible to carry out a proper surgery on the streets, especially with such rudimentary tools. As the three of them discuss the absurdity of the situation, they curiously ask Detective Park where that mysterious man got the needle for the surgery. The detective explains that witnesses said the man bent a needle from a sewing kit, and once he was done with the procedure, he quietly left before the ambulance arrived. Well, that is a lot to take in for the doctors. Anyway, the next scene takes us to a public restroom where our mysterious boy is rinsing his hands to clean off blood. It is then we learn that the AI didn't actually stop performing the surgery at that moment, it was just calculating the surgical path. The boy asks why the AI doesn't have any memories, to which the system explains that its memories seem to have been reset. The boy then inquires if the AI remembers its name. The system responds that it doesn't have one set. Hearing this, our boy then decides to give the AI a new name. Considering that this system is known as a combat support AI, he shortened this term and came up with the name John G. In. He then tells the AI that from now on, it will be called John G. In. The system doesn't immediately respond, so he asks why he isn't getting a reply. The AI explains that it is in the process of setting its new name to Jian Ji In, and also informs him that he can change it any time if he wants. The boy then jokingly suggests the name Blackfire Dragon instead. Well, it looks like even the AI seems slightly embarrassed by the suggestion, and quickly insists that Jian Ji In sounds much better. As he exits the restroom, he once again notices the emblem on his arm that says, Earth Union, and he curiously asks the system about this emblem. The AI explains that the emblem is from a special operations military uniform of the Earth Union. The boy then curiously points out that if the AI is from 2082 and he himself is a special forces agent with memory loss, it doesn't make sense why he's in 2024. The system simply responds that it doesn't have information to answer that query. The boy then suggests using the internet for more information. However, the AI declines, citing the risk of getting hacked and is definitely not looking forward to seeing the location of all the horny hot moms in the area. He then asks his system how it is currently processing information, 
and the system explains that it only receives input through sensory experiences. For instance, if our boy eats something delicious, the AI experiences the same sensation. It outputs information through his body and voice, but needs permission for temporary control to assist during combat. The AI also mentions one thing it cannot do. Even though it can assist with aiming, it cannot pull the trigger. Well, this isn't surprising given it's just a support combat AI. It does limit its capabilities, after all. Besides, who would want AI to take over the world? Anyway, since the system is not helping our boy with anything, he decides he needs to gather information about himself to understand why he's in 2024. The AI confirms that this is correct and that he will need to retrieve this information himself. He then starts looking around, and that is when he spots the building where he can use a computer, and he is sure that this is their key to solving the mystery. The AI asks if he's regained his memories, to which he replies that he hasn't. It's just that his common sense is starting to return, and he believes that if they can access the PC room, they can gather valuable information. The only issue is that he doesn't have any money to get access to its services. In order to make some cash, he asks the AI if it can help him with singing. The AI confirms that since singing is a necessary skill in combat, it can support him in that endeavor. With this in mind, the boy grants the AI temporary control of his body. A while later, we see our boy standing there with the spoon, and he's not sure if it's even necessary. The system explains that he needs to get into the character, so he must pretend he is holding a microphone. Well, that makes some sense, but he is totally confused about why he has to sing in this area. You see, he is literally up against this rock band that's going absolutely wild with their singing, and he's not sure how he's supposed to compete with them. The system tells him that if he displays better skills than the singers, people will naturally pay attention to him. Our boy isn't so sure about this and feels a bit insecure, worried he might become a laughingstock instead of getting the spotlight. He then warns his friendly AI not to overdo it because he doesn't want to embarrass himself. Our boy braces himself and starts singing, and immediately, people start turning their heads. Within minutes, his sweet melodies fill the entire park, capturing everyone's attention. He strikes the perfect pose, adding flair to his performance, making it even more captivating. Meanwhile, the rock band starts to lose their audience, and soon everyone is talking about the guy who's singing so well, even without any instruments. In no time, the crowd disperses, leaving the band stunned with their eyes popping out. The onlookers are visibly moved, with some even starting to cry. They're amazed by how our boy can switch between so many octaves and sing with both male and female qualities. However, they find it a bit odd that he's only performing the middle parts of the songs. Our boy is startled by this observation, and the system quickly explains that it only managed to gather parts of the songs from street performances, so it doesn't have the full versions. Despite this, people start showering him with money, and before long, his box is filled. With quick cash in hand, he bolts out of the park, leaving the audience behind him craving for more of his performance. Meanwhile, inside the PC building, we see a girl who looks quite fascinated by our boy's performance. After seeing him running away, she eventually gets back to her job and starts mopping the floor again. But she then gets an order from her senior. A customer at table 15 has ordered ramen. She responds that she's coming, though her thoughts are still occupied with our boy. She feels quite disappointed that he left the park just when she wanted to listen to him a little longer. Back with our guy, he's walking down the street with the money box in his hands, heading towards his next goal. His next stop is the PC room, and the system tells him to infiltrate the local area discreetly and blend in naturally. After that, they'll need to find a way to contact headquarters. Our boy promptly starts walking toward the building, and that's when he spots a recruitment notice hiring part-time staff for the PC room. It says anyone interested needs to bring their ID card. Looks like our boy just found a perfect way to blend in discreetly, and they even provide meals to the staff. The system quickly tells him to take the job, because that's 100% worth it. As he climbs the stairs, our boy also decides to request a place to sleep. The system agrees, pointing out that once they secure living space, they will have all their basic needs fulfilled, such as food, clothing, and shelter. Our boy also acknowledges this, though he's still unsure about the clothing part. That's when the system informs him that his military uniform has a camouflage transition feature. It's made of special chameleon-like memory fibers that can change into different forms, and the modular clothing can be dismantled into several pieces, then rearranged or reassembled to create a new outfit, offering a variety of looks. He decides to try out the camouflage feature, and a bright light illuminates from him. When it fades, he's now wearing a punk-style suit that makes him look like a pure clown. He remembers seeing similar outfits on singers earlier. Just then, he spots two friends making their way to the PC room. When they see him standing on the stairs, their faces go pale. They quickly pass him with their heads down, avoiding eye contact, and quietly head up to the upper floors while he just stands there. He asks his system if their reaction was because of his outfit, and the system confirms it's possible. 
He then tells his system to reassemble his outfit because he does not want to get fired even before getting hired. After the transition, our boy finally looks somewhat decent, resembling one of the guys we saw earlier. Once he reaches the top floor and enters the PC room, the system starts analyzing the environment. It finds that there are 96 people currently playing games and checks the food facilities and even spots a space that could be temporarily used as a living area. The analysis concludes that this is the most suitable place for our boy to stay for the time being. This is exactly what our boy wanted to hear. He finally meets the manager, who asks if he has a resume or ID card since he wants to apply for the part-time job. Not surprisingly, our boy says he doesn't have either. The manager, while yawning, tells him he can fill out the resume on the spot and bring the ID tomorrow. Since he's short on part-timers, he's willing to make an exception. The protagonist shakes his head in acknowledgement without saying much. The manager gives the boy a quick look and, seeing his pretty face, wonders if he's just a time passer and doubts whether he can even cook instant noodles. He then curiously asks if our boy can even handle a frying pan, since they also serve food to the players. The protagonist shakes his head in acknowledgement without saying much. That is when his system reassures him that it has practical cooking skills for desperate times as well. With that in mind, our boy confidently tells the manager he can easily handle it. Without hesitation, the manager gives him the task of making some fried rice. The protagonist strides confidently into the kitchen, scanning the area for ingredients to make fried rice. He quietly tells the system to whip up some fried rice and make sure it's tasty. By the way, let's not forget that this AI has a really unusual Korean name. Since we're not dealing with tongue twisters here, we'll call him Jarvis from this point onward. With permission granted, Jarvis takes control of his body. He quickly assesses the kitchen, opens the refrigerator, and pulls out the ingredients. After grabbing a cleaver and knife with impressive finesse, he starts preparing the dish. The manager can't help but notice the noise and skillful movements coming from the kitchen. My guy chops vegetables with such flair that the manager is left with his jaw hanging. He's sweating profusely, astonished that this boy isn't just stir-frying frozen rice, but actually cooking from scratch. What's even more baffling is that the meal is prepared at lightning speed, and each dish looks delicious. Our boy finally presents the perfectly crafted dish to the manager. The manager eyes the food with suspicion, because impressive delivery speed is one thing, but it's all for nothing if the food doesn't taste good. Reluctantly, he takes a bite, and as he starts chewing, the boy anxiously waits to see if he's messed up the dish. The manager chews with little to no expression, and after a moment, he puts down his spoon and delivers his verdict. The food is exceptional. In fact, he's so impressed that he literally says, our boy has potential to put Gordon Ramsay out of business. With a hearty pat on the back, the man also admits that he was so lost in the deliciousness of the food that he briefly thought he was in a high-end pub. The same girl we saw earlier walks in and jokingly asks her uncle if he's having shots in the middle of the day. The manager promptly introduces her as his niece to our boy, saying this is his new co-worker, Cha Yun Seo, and reminds him to get along. Yun Seo perks up in happiness as she recognizes him as the same guy who was performing outside earlier. The protagonist looks at her with complete cluelessness, as he has no idea how she even knows about him. She moves closer and asks why he's working part-time at a PC room. He replies that he's always been good at singing and claims he's good at everything. The manager then also chimes in, singing our boy's praises and saying he's thrilled to have someone as talented as him, especially since Yoon Seo's cooking is as good as literal crap. The manager asks if there's a particular shift he prefers. He replies that he's just looking for a part-time job and would like the shifts to be flexible. He also mentions needing a place to stay and asks if he can use the storage room for that purpose while he works. The manager inquires if he doesn't have a home, to which the boy explains he's just out for a bit. Despite the seeming demands, the manager can't bear to let such talent slip away. He reflects on how the PC room next door is famous for its food and thinks his own place could become famous as well. With that in mind, he decides to hire our boy, offering him a spot in the storage room, free lunch and dinner, and a promise to double his pay after a week, but on the condition that he helps boost sales with his cooking. The protagonist sees his chance and quickly agrees to the deal. At that moment, a boy and girl enter the PC room. The girl looks worn out and suggests they eat first before playing, but the guy in glasses argues that the PC room also sells food. The girl points out that the PC room's food isn't very tasty. Just then, a crisp voice catches their attention. It's our boy, with a fire in his eyes. He tells them not to judge the food until they've tried it themselves. A while later, the boy cooks up some delicious food that screams tastiness. Yun Seo and her uncle look at the bowl of food with admiration. The culinary chef then quickly asks for a plate, and Yun Seo rushes to provide one. He expertly plates the food, and the manager is impressed by how even the presentation is flawless. He immediately orders her niece to take the food to the customers, and she hurries off with the dish in hand. While the duo is still bickering and doubting whether the food at this place is really all that, 
Yunseo finally shows up with a perfectly plated dish, catching both the girl and the boy completely off guard. They're absolutely baffled because, like, they haven't even started gaming yet, and somehow, the food's already here. When the platters hit the table, they're both looking skeptical, muttering how they only ordered some basic fried rice. But this stuff looks way too fancy. Yoon Seo can barely contain her excitement as she tells them to go ahead and give it a try first. Finally, they decide to give it a shot, and the moment they take a bite, it's like dopamine explodes in their brains. They're straight up feeling like they've left this world. They even imagine themselves getting all chubby from eating this kind of food regularly, yet they're still chasing that same unbelievable flavor. They do anything just to get another bite. They're literally in tears, and their reactions are so over the top that even people at nearby tables start turning their heads. Hearing these two rave about how this place really has the world's best fried rice, the buzz about this delicious food quickly spreads, and soon enough, everyone's placing orders for the same fried rice. Yunseo, practically glowing with happiness, rushes over to announce that 12 people just ordered fried rice all at once. The manager's eyes practically pop out of his skull at the news. He immediately turns to the boy and asks if he can handle all these orders. The boy sighs, then quietly calls Jarvis to ask if he can manage to whip up 12 servings and make them taste just as amazing. Not surprisingly, Jarvis assures him that tactical field cooking is perfect for handling large batches and that maintaining quality and deliciousness is always the top priority. After a quick transition, we see the manager's eyes light up with dollar signs as he watches the sales figures skyrocket in just three hours. He's so thrilled that he promises a double pay raise for the week. The manager finally asks the boy his name, and our boy pulls a random name out of his ass, Kang In. The greedy manager doesn't even doubt his real identity, and happily tells him that the storage rooms will be cleared out for him. Once the manager is gone, Jarvis asks if the name he just gave was even real. The boy admits he just blurted out the first thing that came to mind. Nevertheless, Jarvis decides to roll with Kang in until he remembers his real name. And that's how our boy landed himself a job. A little later, we see him sitting alone in front of the computer, thinking about how he secured food and a place to stay, but realizes he still needs an ID to get his paycheck. So, he turns to Jarvis and asks if he can hack into the database. Jarvis confirms he can, saying he has hacking skills ranging from the early 21st century all the way to 2082. This surprises our hero, and he quickly asks if that level of skill could hack a bank. Jarvis replies that's impossible because he only has skills related to infiltration. Disappointed, the boy leans back in his chair, thinking how he got his hopes up for nothing. The boy wonders if he's infiltrating 2024 on a secret mission. He then asks the system if it can forge an identity for him. The system agrees right away and asks for temporary control of his hand. Once he gives permission, Jarvis starts hacking into the Korean government's administrative network to find information related to him. While the system is busy with all this boring technical stuff, my guy can't help but feel sleepy. But Jarvis snaps him back to reality, reminding him to keep his eyes open to gather visual data correctly. Suddenly they stumble upon something significant. The name Kang In is already registered, and the fingerprint matches our boy's own. Naturally, he finds this ridiculous. If he's a special forces officer from 2082, how could there be a version of him in this time period? Jarvis quickly begins searching for any United Earth Forces records in 2024. A moment later, he confirms there's no record of such forces existing in this year. Well, this only adds to the confusion, since it means he's somehow existing simultaneously in 2024 and 2082. But Jarvis said that he can't make any judgments without proper information. So the boy instructs him to dig deeper into this personal data, they might as well find an important clue. The system quickly complies, and after sifting through his profile, Jarvis confidently states that he's currently broke and unemployed. Well, that just hits the nerve with our boy. Anyway, Yoon Seo comes rushing over, and the system alerts him about her presence. When she reaches him, she points out how fast he was typing just now, and further asks if he knows how to do programming as well. The boy asks her to stop peeking at his monitor, as he is clearly not a fan of having his privacy invaded. In response, she flashes a credit card from her uncle, explaining he gave it to her for shopping, and invites him to come along with her. Looks like she didn't notice what he was doing on his monitor, so he decides to go out with her. On their way back from the market, she points out how he picked everything so quickly. That is when we learn that he just let Jarvis choose whatever he wanted. Yunseo comments on how heavy the bag is, but he's carrying it like it's nothing. She then also playfully pinches his muscles and blushes, claiming he's made of steel. Once they pass in front of a cafe, she suggests grabbing some coffee at a cafe to make their trip more fun. But our boy reminds her that it's her uncle's card, but she brushes it off, saying there's nothing wrong with using it. Just as she says this, she bumps into a guy in front of her and she stumbles backward from the impact. The guy she bumped into looks like a total jerk, and his companion has the vibe of a gangster. 
They try to intimidate the duo with their menacing glares, making the atmosphere tense. Jarvis gives a quick scan of the two thugs and labels them as hostile. It even asks our boy if he wants to switch to combat mode. Before he can make a decision, Yunseo starts bawling, apologizing, and saying she'll be more careful from now on. Surprisingly, the guys who looked like thugs start to back off, saying they didn't mean to scare a poor girl. The guy with hair explains that his baldy friend lost a game today, so he's in a terrible mood. They claim that they're not trying to pick on her or anything. Yunseo, on the other hand, continues crying and thanking them for letting her go. And with that, the two goons just walk off. Finally, the boy relaxes a bit and asks Yunseo if she's okay. She replies that she's alright but admits she got a little scared and ended up crying. Once they enter the game room, her uncle rushes over, asking why she hasn't answered her phone. It's an emergency. He reveals the shocking news that the entire system suddenly went down and everyone is freaking out. He called the provider, but they won't be here for another hour. Yunseo's face pales as she sees the customers getting angry. One of them was even pushing the ranks when the internet went out. The boy turns to Jarvis, asking for his take on the situation. He wonders if the government records they tried to infiltrate could mean they're being tracked by a hacker. Jarvis reveals that the security techniques in the 2020s aren't advanced enough to track them back, but the boy insists they should still check. So, Jarvis decides to start by checking the terminal base server for any unusual activity. With that in mind, the boy asks the manager where the server is. The man looks puzzled by the unusual question, but replies that it's on the counter and also asks why he's asking. The boy forces a reassuring smile and says he's going to try and fix it. Once he sits down at the computer, Jarvis begins checking things out. After a while, he reports that while there's nothing to indicate they were actively traced, he did find evidence of a hacking attempt. The boy asks why there would be a hacking attempt at just an internet cafe. Jarvis explains that a program designed to steal personal information has been installed, and the conflict between the hacking program and the security system caused the internet to go down. Apparently, this internet cafe's server was used for testing purposes. Without wasting any time, the boy tells the system to find out who the hacker is. Jarvis quickly complies and starts tracing the source. A while later, he locates the hacker's position, noting that the hacker used seven servers to avoid being traced. Six of them are overseas, but one is nearby, indicating they likely picked a local internet cafe to test it out. Speaking of a nearby cafe, our boy remembers those two thugs from earlier and wonders if they could be involved in all this hacking mess. Suddenly, someone in the background shouts about getting disconnected just when he was about to rush the enemy. Seeing the customer getting more and more frustrated, the boy turns to Jarvis and asks if there's anything that could help calm the angry customers down. The system points out that treating them to something delicious will do the trick. With that, the boy picks an item from the menu, and after preparing it, he offers a cup of snacks to this agitated customer. As annoyed as he might be, the customer can't resist the allure of the free snack. In a flash, he yanks the cup from the boy's hands and shoves it into his mouth. As soon as that deliciousness hits his stomach, he's hit with a rush of dopamine that leaves him completely stunned. As expected, the customer breaks into a happy dance, and our boy quickly starts pouring more snacks into the customer's cup, trying to keep the good vibes rolling. The girl is blown away by how he just charmed a customer with his snacks, and she's curious about what the heck he put in them to calm the angry man down. She tries the snacks herself and instantly becomes a fan. She can't get over the spicy, slightly tangy flavor that's also sweet and salty. He then offers her another cup to lay her off and tells her he's heading out to resolve the internet issue. With that, he leaves, leaving the girl blushing as she daydreams about having a hero like him to marry, someone who can always whip up delicious grub for her. Anyway, once he's out, he heads straight toward the enemy base to catch the hackers. Once they reach the enemy base, the system quickly scans the building and confirms there are no cameras or security guards. With that in mind, our boy starts heading upstairs, hearing some commotion coming from above. To understand what's going on, Jarvis amplifies the voices, and now he can hear the thugs loud and clear. They're actually threatening a student to do some dirty work for them, and hearing this makes him furious. Meanwhile, the thugs inside continue to berate the poor boy. But before they can do anything serious, our guy kicks the front door down and makes his grand entrance into the room like a total Sigma male. The goons quickly turn to him, while the glasses-wearing student is panicking on the ground. For a moment he calms down, but then he starts to panic even more, realizing there are even more thugs involved in this mess, and he's pretty sure he's officially screwed. The thugs ask each other if they left the door unlocked, but they confirm to one another that it was already secured. The main thug gets absolutely infuriated and demands to know how our boy got into the room. But before he can say more, my guy delivers a solid punch to the bastard's face that sends blood gushing from his nose as he crashes to the ground. Before we move further into the story, we're introduced to this guy with glasses. His name is Ansyong Hwan. He's a first-year student at Korea University 
and has been fascinated with computer hacking since he was young. Even though he's just a freshman, professionals come to him with questions because he's already made a name for himself as a talented white hat hacker. While searching for a part-time job to help with student loans, he received an unexpected recruitment notice. He was shocked by the offer, and with the amount of money on the table, how could he refuse? So, he enjoyed that night to the fullest, excited about finally landing a job in a field he was good at. But, well, it turned out to be a scam. The company wasn't even legitimate, and just as he was getting beaten up by these scammers, he thought to himself, am I really going to die a virgin? But right then, my guy showed up and knocked out that punk with a single punch. Looks like our boy's feeling a bit bad after knocking that poor guy out with a single punch. But his system quickly reminds him that this is an infiltration mission, so they have to eliminate any enemies interfering with their task. Still, he can't shake the fact that he's a lot stronger than he thought. That big guy just collapsed from one punch, and it's kind of messing with his head. The system then scans the two remaining thugs, identifying that they're armed. At first, our boy's scared to take them down, but Jarvis reassures him that there's nothing to fear as long as he's got assistance. With that, my guy points his finger at these thugs and questions their audacity to bully a poor student, calling them octopus. Naturally, the thugs aren't too thrilled with the insult. The guy with hair quickly lunges at our boy, dagger in hand, but my guy delivers a quick kick right to his ugly face, and he hits the ceiling so hard that his head literally drills a hole into it, leaving him stuck up there. Then the bald guy charges at him with his own dagger, but my guy moves so fast it's almost unbelievable. With just one kick, he knocks the bald thug down to the ground. Amazed by himself, my guy can't believe he was able to put that guy in a hole with just one kick. The system then reveals that his kick strength is now five times stronger than that of a normal human. While he is busy geeking out over his new superhuman abilities, the guy with glasses is losing his mind. He sees our boy mumbling to himself and gets even more anxious and terrified, wondering if he's a police officer communicating via radio. He's feeling terrified because, no matter how innocent he seems now, his past doesn't reflect a solid track record of ethical hacking. He quickly starts apologizing to Kang, insisting he hasn't done anything wrong and trying to explain that he's just been following orders. He pleads with our boy to let him go, claiming he's really a good guy. Jarvis quickly reports to him that this guy is telling about 90% of the truth, as he seems to be a white hat hacker. But despite the 90% truthfulness, our boy still wants to know what the other 10% is that he's lying about, so he asks the glasses guy why he's here. The timid hacker explains that he was tricked into a security check part-time job and has been trapped here for three days. He emphasizes that those guys are really bad and that even after this job, they were planning to make him do worse things. Kang then specifically asks what kind of things the hacker is talking about, to which the guy responds that it's stock manipulation. Kang finds it odd because, looking at these goons, he can tell they look too dumb for that kind of operation. The hacker explains that he was told to create a program to manipulate comments on stock forums. They went to a nearby internet cafe to install the program, so he has a hunch they must be part of a stock manipulation group. Kang then points out that there's probably someone behind them since these guys seem like subcontractors. In any case, Kang feels relieved that they're not specifically targeting his turf, but he still doesn't want to let these goons slip away. He decides to call the police, leaving the glasses guy in shock as he realizes that our boy isn't actually an officer. The hacker refers to our boy as an old man and nervously asks if he contacts the police. Won't he get in trouble for beating the crap out of these thugs? My guy gets annoyed at being called an old coot but politely explains that he's just a stranger in a mask who happened to pass by and heard the commotion, so he basically just saved an innocent student. With that, he starts to leave, but the hacker quickly calls him out. Kang asks if he wants him to stay until the police arrive. That's not really what the hacker had in mind, though. He hesitantly asks if he can beat these punks as well. My guy reminds him that he doesn't need to ask anything, which perks the hacker up. He admits he was just afraid the thugs might wake up, and no one would be there to save him but Kang assures him that they won't be waking up anytime soon. With that, the coward swings his punch and lands a hit on the bald guy's head. The thug suddenly stands up, which scares the hell out of the hacker guy. Eventually, the police arrive and are bewildered to see how badly these thugs have been knocked out. They curiously ask what in the world happened here. The hacker reports that these bastards kept him locked up for three days, beating him and demanding he create a stock forum manipulation program. They said they would kill him if he failed. The officers shoot him a suspicious look and ask how the thugs ended up like this. The guy panics and quickly tries to explain that a passerby heard the commotion and came to help him. The two detectives start talking among themselves, with one suggesting that these guys look too stupid to have come up with a scheme to manipulate stock prices, which means there's probably someone else behind them. While the attendants are taking the injured thugs out, the detective tells them that when these guys wake up in the hospital, they should be interrogated thoroughly. 
Since they'll still be groggy and under the influence of drugs, they might unintentionally slip some interesting information. We also see Detective Park from before, who is involved this time as well. He asks his fellow officer who might have beaten these guys up like this, and his friend explains that the victim said it was just a passerby. They then discuss their next steps. The cigarette-smoking detective suggests they should secure the CCTV and find out who that passerby was. He explains that they don't necessarily need to arrest him, but this is too big of a deal to let slide without investigation. We then see our boy walking down the street, asking Jarvis if he's sure that building didn't have any CCTV. His friendly AI explains confidently that there are no cameras that captured their actions. Our boy then points out how one of the jerks quickly stood up after getting hit, and Jarvis explains that it was just a knee-jerk reaction, an expected reflex. He then asks Jarvis if he can make phone calls as well, to which the AI sadly replies no. With that in mind, Kang decides he needs to get a smartphone for himself first. Since that day, three days have passed. The day after rescuing the hacker, our boy went to the registered address to gather information about himself, but the place turned out to be an empty, barren field in Gangwon province. All that remains are rumors that it burned down. He starts questioning who he is and what he's doing there, wondering if he's really communicating with the future or if he's a person from the future who came to the past. With no more clues to investigate, only questions remain, and he has no choice but to return empty-handed. He gets back to the PC room, and the entire hall is bustling with people. Business is thriving even more than before, largely thanks to some social media influencers. This place has become as busy as it gets, all thanks to our boy, who's the one serving special dishes at the cafe. When he's not around, the cafe owner doesn't sell special dishes, and this random sales tactic has unexpectedly made a big impact. Now whether he's there or not, it's packed with customers. Some come just to eat, but most stay to use the cafe for at least an hour or two. Judging by the owner, Cha Dong Sok's broad smile, it's clear he's raking in a lot of cash and has even started hiring more part-timers for the cafe. One of the new part-timers the manager introduces to our boy happens to be the same hacker, An Xiong Huan. The manager looks at his CV and is thrilled to see he's studying computer science. The hacker confirms this and adds that he's been good with computers for a long time, claiming that if anything breaks, he can fix it in no time. Xiong Huan then pays his respects to his fellow part-timers, excited about working with them. As he does, we get a peek into his thoughts. Apparently, he joined the cafe because he felt guilty about causing damage to it, even though he was forced to do it. He knows it wasn't something he should have done, so he's determined to work hard and make amends. The manager then introduces our boy, telling the hacker that he is Kang In, the one who turned the cafe into a famous spot. He's working as a chef but is also great with computers, so he recommends they two should help each other out and get along. With that, the manager leaves them alone. After staring at Kang for a moment, Xiong Huan suddenly perks up, as if he has realized something. This startles our boy, who worries that Xiong Huan might have recognized him as the masked guy who saved him. But that's not the case. Xiong Huan simply points out that our boy is just older than him. Nonetheless, he greets him warmly, and they shake hands as a gesture of goodwill. All the while, Jarvis tells Kang to just tell the owner to fire Xiong Huan, arguing that working with someone he rescued is risky and might blow his cover. My guy just lets out a sigh and quietly replies to his AI that Song Huan just called him Big Bro. So how could he get him fired? A while later we see Kang out for shopping. Jarvis has the entire list checked off, confirming that they've purchased all the items and that receipts are being carefully kept. Kang points out how the system seems especially meticulous about money and food. Just as Jarvis tries to respond, he glitches for a moment and suddenly flashes a warning about a fire hazard. But when Kang looks ahead, there's nothing of the sort. He notes that Jarvis seems intentionally trying to change the topic to avoid his previous question. The system insists he's not dodging the topic. And just as our boy calls Jarvis a liar, an explosion occurs on the top floor of one of the nearby buildings. Upon seeing the fire, he is confident that since he's equipped with combat support AI, augmented reality technology in his eyes, auxiliary modules in his ears, and enhanced strength in his legs, a fire like this should not be a problem. He should be able to put it out in one shot. With that in mind, he prepares himself and tries to release a fire extinguishing beam, but nothing happens. The system then asks if he's lost his brain cells or something. Anyway, he asks Jarvis about the easiest way to put out the fire, and the AI explains that calling a fire truck is the easiest option. But it looks like there's no time for the truck to arrive. The people stuck inside are screaming for help. Apparently there's a girl trapped on the rooftop, and our boy isn't going to sit around twiddling his thumbs waiting for the truck to arrive. He then quickly pulls out his mask and asks the system for the estimated arrival time of the fire truck. The system responds that it would take nearly four minutes, but the flames are likely to reach the roof within that time. If they don't act now, there's a 99% chance the girl will likely die. 
Kang immediately tells the system to find an entry route. The system highlights the best path, which the only option is to climb the building directly since there are no available paths inside. This route will also help him avoid the toxic gas as he ascends. With that, my guy uses his ninja reflexes and starts parkouring his way to the top. Once he reaches a considerable height, he asks the system to check if there are any survivors on the other floors. The system replies that it can't detect any. Keeping that in mind, they start climbing even higher. Onlookers watching him wonder if there's a Spider-Man crawling up the building. Suddenly, the system flashes a red warning, stating that an explosion risk has been detected ahead. But after some slick moves, he finally makes his way to the top, where he finds the timid girl sitting in the corner. He extends his hand, and the girl begins to cry, proclaiming him as her savior. But suddenly, a giant explosion rocks the area, leaving her wide-eyed in shock. As she's freaking out, he tells her to shut the hell up because he's calculating the best route. Unfortunately, it seems like there's no path other than jumping off the building directly. Before doing something that risky, he asks the system if he can hold her and jump to the next building without getting hurt. The system warns him that too many people are watching, and if they see his superhuman abilities, it'll blow his cover and make it a lot harder for him to fit in here. That's when he spots a clothesline nearby and asks the system if he should use it to climb down. The girl quickly protests that it's not a good idea, while Jarvis explains that the lower parts of the building are engulfed in fire, making all escape routes unsafe. So, our boy decides to grab the clothesline and use it to tightrope across to the next building. This freaks the girl out even more, and she makes it clear that she won't risk her life like that. But Jarvis, on the other hand, reveals to Kang that this method is still a viable option. The girl keeps questioning how they can possibly walk a tightrope at this height, but he reassures her that he'll support her. With that, he quickly secures one end of the rope to their building. Jarvis tells him to just throw the other end to the next building since throwing is an easy action he can't mess up. Taking a deep breath, our boy spins the rope and throws it with all his might, muttering about how this system can literally cook but can't help throwing a freaking rope. Thankfully, the rope hooks onto the other building. Once it's secured, he grabs the girl in his arms and starts walking across the tightrope, leaving the people below utterly in awe. The girl keeps praying to the gods while he tells her to stay still, and he is quite confident that they'll make it across in no time, or so he thought. Jarvis suddenly warns him that the rope is breaking faster than expected. Kang quickly asks how long it can hold them. Jarvis replies that at this rate, the rope will snap before they make it. Just as he says that, the rope starts to burn. In a panic, my guy yanks the girl midair toward the roof of the other building. She fortunately lands on the rooftop with butt first, but the rope barely holds on before it finally snaps. As he falls, he quickly grabs the fraying rope. With its support, he maneuvers himself against the building and starts climbing up. He finally makes it to the rooftop and lands like a total badass. But deep inside, his heart had skipped a beat, because he had almost thought that he was going to get screwed. While the girl tends to her injuries, our boy suddenly shows up, freaking her out. She quickly asks how he's even alive and wonders if he's some kind of superhuman. He just shrugs and says, she can think that if she wants. Curious, she asks why he's talking to her so casually, wondering if he's one of her OnlyFans followers. He just remains quiet because he literally has no idea who she is. As she looks away, he starts berating his AI, saying he barely got out alive from that dangerous situation and questioning what kind of lousy combat support AI is that can't make proper judgments. Then the girl walks over and asks if he's the internet cafe chef. This shocks our boy and he has no clue how she even knows him. But before we dive deeper into their interaction, the fire brigade arrives, and the flames are finally put out. Video of our boy's heroic deed goes viral, and once again, Detective Park is involved in the case. He's scratching his head, trying to figure out if the guy who rescued the girl was a rock climber or a tightrope expert. His partner asks if he has any clue who it might be, but Park admits he has no idea. He pulls out a plastic bag filled with goods and explains that this is their only clue. They found the bag near the building so it makes sense that the man trying to rescue the girl must have put it down. It seems like our guy is slowly becoming a kind of Batman, except instead of Gotham City, he's patrolling the streets of Seoul, where serious weapons are off the table. Anyhow, they open the bag, finding only items used for cooking. There's a receipt, but it's wet and torn, making it hard to read. Though the store name is still visible, they decide to check the CCTV. Park's partner yawns, questioning if it's even necessary to learn about this guy especially if the fire was caused by an electrical issue or a gas leak, then it's not their case to investigate. Just then, Detective Park receives a call from his senior. The senior explains that this wasn't a simple short circuit or gas leak. It was an elaborate arson. They're still piecing together the details, but one death has already been reported on the third floor. Both detectives feel annoyed hearing this, as they thought there were no casualties and that they could wrap up the case quickly. Park then acknowledges the situation, 
stating he'll start the investigation right away, beginning with looking for the tightrope master. Meanwhile, we find our boy and the girl exiting the public bathing station. She looks totally refreshed after that amazing bath, while our boy is annoyed that she's making him pay for her spa day, even though he's the one who saved her. With cute puppy eyes, she asks if he doesn't feel a shred of sympathy for a poor girl who just lost her home in a horrible arson. Then she gets serious, explaining that she lived alone and has no place to go because she took out student loans to register for college. She was planning to work part-time to make ends meet, but now she's not sure how she's going to survive. He reminds her of her own words, telling her to just get a part-time job. She moans, saying she hasn't even gotten over the loss of her house, so how can she start working right away? That's when our boy starts walking away, knowing she's just being a drama queen. The girl quickly asks if the internet cafe is hiring part-timers and starts clinging to our boy, begging him to let her join. He brushes her off, telling her to talk to the boss, as he's just a part-timer too and can't really help her get a job. Eventually, he gives up and asks if she's good at anything. She proudly claims she's great at streaming games and that people even call her streaming beauty. Since she doesn't have a computer at home, she always streamed from an internet cafe. The boy then fires off rapid questions, and after a bit of back and forth, he decides to let her submit her resume. When they return to the PC room, we are met with a surprised look from Cha Eun Seo. The streamer girl quickly introduces herself, flashing a bright smile. Yun Seo, however, turns to our boy, reminding him he had gone out to buy sauces, so why has he returned empty-handed? He awkwardly replies, saying he lost them while watching the fire incident. The girl laughs at the thought of him being so excited about the fire that he literally lost his stuff. He shrugs it off, saying they can just deduct the money from his wages. Suddenly, Jarvis calls out to him, reporting that based on his analysis of the incident, there's a chance many people filmed the fire and they need to search the internet to gather information on what people saw. He quickly walks toward the PC while the streamer girl talks to the manager about the part-time job. A bit later, they come across a video of the tightrope hero who saved a beauty. The video has been reposted countless times, spreading online like wildfire. He then asks his AI if it can hack into the internet and delete all of the videos. Jarvis simply says no, which prompts our boy to ask him then how in the hell he was able to literally hack into the government database. Jarvis replies that it was only for identity manipulation. He explains that he does have military-grade hacking defense skills, but since there are no hackers present, he can't really showcase those abilities. Meanwhile, Detective Park is standing outside the PC room building, clearly drawn here by all the evidence pointing to this location. He's eager to finally catch that tightrope master at this internet cafe. Meanwhile, we're back in our boy's tiny room, where Jarvis is tallying up yet another day without finding a clue about the Earth Alliance or their true identity. Our guy even tried asking on Reddit if time traveling back to 2082 is possible, but all he got were trolls making fun of him for asking such a ridiculous question. But Jarvis reminds him that he's way more advanced than the technology of 2024. Even Kang kinda agrees. After all, an AI implanted into a human body is straight up impossible with today's tech. He shrugs off the confusion and asks Jarvis about that recent fire incident. Jarvis explains that one person was found dead in the building. Of course, our boy freaks out, wondering how they could have missed someone and if it was his fault. Jarvis reassures him it wasn't technically his fault. The body was found in a room they passed by while climbing the outer wall of the building yesterday. Kang asks how he failed to spot the person inside and wonders if they don't have infrared vision or something like that. Jarvis explains that their lenses are just augmented reality devices, not infrared vision. Kang calls him clumsy for such a slip-up, not detecting a living human inside the building. Jarvis clarifies there were no signs of movement, sound, or any other indication of life in the surrounding area. As soon as Kang hears this, his mind perks up, realizing the person might have already been dead. It makes him wonder if the fire wasn't an accident but a carefully planned murder. Jarvis agrees, saying there's a chance that could be the case. That's when he hears a knock on the door, and we already know it's Detective Park, who's there with the stuff Kang left on the streets. The card used to buy those items had this address on it. When Cha Yun Seo sees the items, she perks up, and just then, our boy walks out. She quickly informs him that the police officer brought back the seasoning he lost while watching the fire yesterday. Detective Park feels a bit unsettled to hear this, realizing our boy isn't a suspect after all, just some passerby who happened to be there during the fire. Meanwhile, Miss Cha jokingly comments on how amazing Korea's police are, being able to track down the owners of even small things like this and return them. Kang thanks the officer for his help, and Detective Park casually slips him a business card, saying if he has any tips about the incident, he should reach out. Our boy then asks Jarvis if he should get the detective involved since it might help them catch the murderer sooner. Jarvis reassures him it's safe to meet the detective now that our boy has confirmed identity. Miss Cha then asks if he's free because she wants to work with him and get closer. On the other hand, 
Jarvis tells our boy that it would be beneficial to get acquainted with the local police for future operations. Kang agrees as well and decides to just get closer, but Miss Cha thinks he's talking to her and starts jumping for joy, saying she'd be thrilled to work with him. Her happiness quickly fades though, when this cold boy tells her he has an errand to run for the day and needs to leave. As he walks away, she can't help but blush, thinking how this guy is really hard to understand. The next scene takes us to the police station. In one of the detective departments, Detective Park is startled to see our boy there and promptly asks if he's the owner of the stuff found on the street. Kang confirms he is, and Detective Park laughs, saying he shouldn't have come to the police department just to give a personal thank you. But our boy replies that he's not there for that. Park's laughter fades as he asks why he is there, and our boy explains that he has information about yesterday's fire incident. He explains that it was actually an elaborate murder. Detective Park doesn't seem to take it seriously at first, saying that since there was a fatality, it's worth looking into. But our boy insists there's a very high chance it was a murder. The detective asks if he has any evidence because random guesses from a civilian can just confuse the investigation. Our boy replies that he didn't see anyone moving in the room when he was up on the tightrope. At first, Detective Park doesn't react. But then his jaw literally drops, and he spills his coffee when he realizes the tightrope master is actually our boy. Kang flashes a thumbs up in response, confirming that he really is the one. Detective Park then asks why he didn't mention this earlier, to which Kang responds that he wasn't asked about it. The detective gets frantic, asking our boy how the hell he climbed up like Spider-Man, carried someone on the rope, and then ran along the wall. Kang quickly reminds him that's not the point right now. That's when Detective Park pulls out a pen and paper, asking all the serious questions, and wanting him to explain again why he thinks it was a murder. Our boy explains that there was no movement in that room, even with the fire raging. It only makes sense if the victim was either already dead or might have been intoxicated by alcohol or drugs. The detective acknowledges this, and he assumes that the building must be set on fire intentionally to cover up the murder. Just then, another officer chimes in, asking Park if the National Forensic Service has contacted them yet. Park responds, Of course not. It takes time to perform an autopsy, and with the fire being so intense, they said nothing might come out of it. Then a lady officer reports that they just got word the fire was most likely caused by an electrical short circuit. The guy asks her if she checked the CCTV, and she replies that there wasn't a single camera in the area. The officers then discuss whether they should make a sketch of all the suspects who left the building at that time. Our boy perks up at this and quietly asks Jarvis if he remembers the faces of the people they saw yesterday. Jarvis quickly agrees, saying he stored the visual information collected before the fire. He asks if Kang wants him to play it back. Kang gives the go-ahead, and the AI starts playing the footage from the previous day, telling Detective Park that he saw four people walking from the direction of the building. He thoroughly explains how the first person came out of the alley by the building, holding a phone in his right hand and talking on it. He mentions that the guy had a bracelet on his left wrist, a red checkered shirt with two buttons missing, and a gray phone case with a white shirt underneath. Detective Park is left with his mouth hanging open, amazed at how our boy is providing such an accurate description, almost like the same person is sitting right in front of him. Well, he's not too far off since he's literally describing what he is currently seeing. Anyway, our boy continues with his explanation, detailing the other two people as well. Detective Park then asks if he could help create a sketch. That's when our boy jumps from his seat and says he can draw it. He grabs a piece of paper, clicks the pen, and tells the AI to project the three suspects onto the paper. With that, he starts outlining the details, and a little while later, he says he's done. When the officers see his sketches, they're absolutely unsettled because his drawings look like they were drawn by the foot. But honestly, they still look way better than anything I could do. Anyway, our boy crumples up the drawing and tosses it aside, saying he needs more time. The detective acknowledges this, though they're not quite sure what he's planning. Kang then curses at Jarvis, asking why he didn't just draw it himself. The AI explains he can only move if granted temporary control. While he's going back and forth with Jarvis, the two detectives are busy dialing up a professional sketch artist. But honestly, it seems like there might not even be a need for one. The blinding blue light shimmers, and our boy's finesse catches the attention of both detectives. When they look over, he is sketching away like a printing machine, not breaking a sweat as he draws the whole picture in the blink of an eye. Everyone is left stunned to see this, because his sketches look like they were made by a machine. They ask him if he's some kind of genius. Anyway, our boy lays out the three sketches and points out that only three people left the alley before the fire started. If the arsonist was fleeing, they'd be among those three. The entire office is left in awe at this insightful conclusion. And that's when the senior officer steps up, orders his team to verify the identities of those three right away. The next day, we're back at the PC room, where our hero has laid out some delicious food for his fellow part-timers. While they're eating this deliciousness, 
Miss Cha tells the streamer girl that the fire at the building wasn't an accident. It was arson. Not surprisingly, the streamer girl's jaw drops in disbelief, especially since her own apartment was also caught in the fire as well. Looks like the case has been solved, and our boy is amazed at how fast the news spread. Just then, he gets a phone call from Detective Park. The detective happily explains that they caught the culprit. Apparently, two of the people in the montage were local residents, but the third wasn't from around here. Turns out he was friends with the victim. They still need to investigate the exact cause, but they found drugs in this guy's wallet. It seems he came to take money for the drugs, and when he didn't get any, he killed his buyer. What's even crazier is that the police quickly tracked down the ones selling the drugs and raided the scene. They even caught the prominent actor Na Jung Gion there, throwing the entire entertainment industry into chaos. Kang can't help but point out how this whole incident is just getting bigger and bigger. The detective agrees, saying it looks like there's no vacation for him this time since the case isn't closing anytime soon. Still, he's glad that thanks to our boy and the sketches he drew, they managed to speed things up a hundredfold. He wonders if they can make those sketches public. Before Kang can say anything, Jarvis reminds him that he might become a public sensation, which is going to put them in a lot of spotlight, but there's no need to hide these details as well. Eventually, our boy tells the detective he doesn't mind if the sketches go public, but he just wants him to keep quiet about who drew them. His co-workers perk up at what he's saying on the phone, while Detective Park can't help but point out that he's a true hero. Kang brushes it off, saying he's just doing his job. The others perk up even more, quickly asking what he drew for Detective Park. He just brushes it off, claiming it was just a little doodle. The three of them start laughing, teasing him that the drawing must have been really bad if he doesn't want them to mention he drew it. But our boy just tells them they can think whatever they want. Suddenly there's commotion nearby and it looks like some guy just spilled his ramen. While Miss Cha mutters about how these clumsy customers keep spilling ramen, the hacker guy tells the streamer girl to handle the cleanup. After she's done cleaning up the mess, she starts thinking about asking for a bonus. But that's when she bumps into someone while clumsily walking around. The customer falls to the floor and the girl panics, apologizing repeatedly and asking if he's okay. The man tells her to be careful, complaining that she hurt his wrist. Meanwhile, our boy watches the entire scene and asks Jarvis if the wrist is really broken. Jarvis quickly reports that based on the hand's movement, there's a possibility of a fracture. But to be sure, he'd need to touch the hand and observe the person's response. Kang gives Jarvis the green light, so he walks over, grabs the customer's wrist, and Jarvis quickly reports back that the muscles, ligaments, and joints are fine, and no bone damage, but the wrist is sprained. Kang promptly tells the customer that his bone is fine, but it's just a mild sprain, and reassures him that he'll help make it hurt less. While Miss Cha can't help but feel admiration for her crush, the hacker points out that our boy is also really good at massages. Miss Cha then thinks about getting hurt too, since it's the only way she could score a massage from him. Kang, on the other hand, further tells the man to avoid any strenuous work until tomorrow because if he pushes it, it'll get worse. The man explains that he can't live without cooking. It's part of his job. He reveals that he runs a food truck and there's an emergency film shoot they urgently called his food truck. That's when the streamer girl volunteers to help the customer, but the man isn't so sure and asks if she can actually cook. The girl admits that she can cook ramen pretty well. The customer sighs, saying that no matter how dire the situation gets, he can't just serve ramen. He wonders if someone good at cooking could help out, and that's when he starts looking at our boy with innocent eyes. Jarvis picks up on what the man wants, and he urges our boy to just say yes. Despite this, Kang turns the customer down, but the customer quickly ups the offer, saying he'll pay him 300,000 won if he helps out. As soon as that six-digit number registers in our boy's head, he gives the man a high five, excitedly asking if he just needs to cook rice and some side dishes. The customer perks up with happiness, feeling honored to get help from someone like our boy, who could seriously give Gordon Ramsay a run for his money. He recalls how he's heard this PC room has a reputation for great food, and he just came to check it out. The food was apparently quite delicious, so he's been coming back ever since, thinking he might learn something. Now that the legend himself is about to help him, he feels there's nothing to worry about. We then hear our boy talking to Jarvis, and we learn that he agreed to help because he plans to investigate other regions as well, and the money he's getting is just a nice bonus. As the next morning arrives, their food truck rolls down the road and Kang is driving. The customer is genuinely impressed to see how amazing Kang's driving skills are. He didn't even realize his truck could drive this smoothly. By the way, let's give this man a proper name and call him Franklin from this point onward. Franklin then recalls the recent incident, mentioning that the news blew up about an actor getting caught at a drug party. Our boy agrees, saying he's heard about it too. That's when Franklin further reveals that the place they're headed to is where that same actor was filming, and the movie was supposed to release in about a week. 
Kang asks if they're still going to release it now that the main actor has been caught up in something like this. Franklin just shakes his head, saying who would want to watch a movie with a drug-addicted actor? Now they're reshooting every scene that featured him. While the guy is glad he's getting work out of it, the atmosphere is intense over there, and everyone is panicking as they scramble to reshoot all the scenes with a new actor. Kang asks why they don't just push back the release. Franklin explains it's a bit tricky. They've already locked in a ton of theaters. If they delay, they might lose all those spots, and the production company could tank. Kang points out that the director must be feeling the heat right now. Franklin responds positively, saying the director is Sun Tai Min, one of the top dogs in romance films in Korea. He's pretty sure things will turn out just fine in the end. The scene transitions to the director himself, who's puffing away on a cigarette, trying to blow off some steam. He looks completely defeated since nothing's going the way he planned. The guy next to him notices the tension and nervously asks if they should reshoot the scene. The director just mutters that they don't have time, and they're stuck settling for this garbage. He's absolutely fuming, thinking about how his big project got derailed by that druggy scumbag. He then lets out a frustrated scream, saying that if he ever gets his hands on that guy, he'll personally take him out for tanking the movie. That is when his assistant reports that the food truck is ready and suggests they take a break to eat, especially since the crew is exhausted. But the director snaps at him and asks this fool how can he even think about food right now. If this movie flops, they will be in debt, and even the cost of the food truck is a waste, so he just tells him to tell the truck driver to go away. Well, that was until he actually tasted our boy's cooking. The second the director bites into the food, he looks completely calm, like a switch flipped. For a second, he even wonders if they spiked the food with some drugs. The assistant then reveals to the director that the original food truck owner hurt his wrist, so he's hired a chef to help out with the cooking. And honestly, this young guy is pretty impressive with his cooking. He also reminds the director how nice the mountain scenery is, which is just a little extra treat, so he tells him to stay positive and relax a bit. He's just glad that at least the other actors haven't run into any trouble. But just as the assistant says this, someone shouts out to the director that there's been an accident. Not surprisingly, the director's face drops when he hears this. A lady comes running up, saying that the stunt double twisted their ankle while filming. This lady is Shin Yoon Ha, and once the director hears this, he throws his chopsticks down and rushes toward the injured man, who's groaning in pain and apologizing to the director for this mess, saying he should have been more careful. The director quickly shouts for someone to call 911, but someone from the crowd reminds him that calling an ambulance in the mountains is impossible. The director yells out if there's anyone who can at least provide first aid, but all he gets in response is silence. Meanwhile, both of our chefs catch the commotion, and Franklin even jokes that this movie seems like it's cursed. He then asks our boy if he can't treat something like this, since he managed to sprain his wrist earlier. Jarvis then promptly reports to him that if they stabilize the ankle using some field first aid techniques, it should help relieve the pain and aid recovery. But Kang remembers that he heard them shouting that the ankle was twisted. To check by himself, he walks over to the injured man and tells everyone to let him check it out. The onlookers whisper among themselves, wondering how a chef can cure injuries. Kang then turns to the director and reminds him that all he can do is provide first aid, but they'll still need to send the injured guy to a hospital immediately. The director agrees, and our boy turns to the girl from before, addressing her as a staff person and asking if she can quickly bring him a compression bandage. The girl looks bewildered at being called so casually without her original title, but the director quickly orders her to move and grab the compression bandage. She agrees and starts to head off. Looks like she has not gotten over how our guy just called her staff person without even recognizing who she is. She's feeling a bit humiliated because she's Shin Yoon Ha, an actress in the movie, even if her role is just a supporting one. She annoyingly hands over the bandages and twirls around, still fuming, while Kang gets back to patching up the injured guy. Just as he starts wrapping the bandage, the actor suddenly shouts in pain, catching Shin Yoon Ha's attention. Jarvis, on the other hand, reveals that the injured actor has severely sprained his ankle, but thankfully it wasn't as bad as they had described, and the first aid is finally complete. The girl looks bewildered as she asks the injured man if he's okay. He replies that he feels fine right now, but it hurt a lot when he got hurt. Now it feels like his bones are back in place, and he thinks he can walk. However, our boy reminds him that filming will be impossible for him. Once the director hears this, he nearly faints, seeing how everything is going south. His assistant quickly tells him they can just call in another stunt double. The director then asks how they can find someone with a similar build and face to Kim Yu chan and get them all the way out to the middle of the mountains. The lead actor himself chimes in, saying he doesn't need any other actor because he can perform his role on his own. But the director shoots back, reminding everyone that this guy is clumsy as hell, and if he messes up his ankle, they won't be able to do anything. Just as the director sinks further into despair, 
asking God why he has to endure this torment, our boy steps forward, declaring that the person sent from heaven has arrived. He admits that this line is a bit dramatic, but he is confident that he can handle the job. That woman over there, however, starts fuming, saying there's no way they can let this random dude enter the film. He's not an aspiring actor nor part of the crew. He's just a chef who runs a food truck, but the director doesn't pay any attention to what she's ranting about. When he looks at our boy side by side with Kim Yuchan, he realizes they actually look a bit alike. Desperation takes over him as he quickly strides over to our boy, asking if he has any physical skills. Since they are short on time, they can make exceptions even if he is less experienced. They're even willing to apply some makeup, and if it's a little rough, they can fix it with CGI. Our guy agrees but demands he be paid triple for this gig. The director agrees without a second thought, while the actress and the assistant literally begin to cry, thinking the movie is finally doomed. Once they arrive on set, the director explains that since Kim Yu chan is the male lead, he has to save the supporting actress. Since the original villain of this movie turned out to be an actual ex-drug dealer, they now have to reshoot all the scenes that featured him. After handing over the script, the director says he's going to go smoke a pack of cigarettes while everyone else gets ready. With that, our boy spends quite a bit of time studying the script alongside the other supporting characters. But after reading through this lousy script, Jarvis points out that this isn't how filming should be done. He speaks from experience, having some filming skills from training manuals, and explains that this particular scene requires more practical movements. With that in mind, our boy tells these goons that instead of pretending, the three of them should actually attack him for real. Of course, these clowns have no clue what in the hell he's talking about, but our boy explains to them to attack him as if they're really fighting him, and he'll handle it appropriately, and it'll look way more realistic on camera. But everyone raises concerns that if anyone gets hurt, it might drag the entire movie down with them, since it all now depends on a few selected actors. Meanwhile, Shin Yun ha with her usual swagger, throws her weight around, frustratingly asking what our boy knows about acting. Well, we can tell that she's still mad that Kang hasn't recognized her as one of the famous actresses. Anyway, once our boy gets dressed up, he turns to the director and asks if they can shoot this in one take without any cuts. He's planning to go straight into action without a rehearsal, thinking that way they can save time. The director looks skeptical but says that if he can nail it in one take, that would be great. Still, he's not sure if it's even possible. Our guy just reminds the director to trust in the power of triple pay. With that, he walks off, declaring they're going to go straight through without any cuts or interruptions. The director has no idea what to say and just nods. It's the only thing he can do at the moment. Plus, his experience as a top-tier director tells him this guy seems trustworthy. The movie shoot finally kicks off with the opening scene showcasing the damsel in distress. She's shouting for help while the thugs approach her, perfectly embodying their roles as pervy side characters. Suddenly, Kang bursts onto the scene with a dramatic kick on the door. After jumping down from above, he lands right in front of the thugs, leaving the three goons utterly bewildered, wondering how the heck he even pulled that off. Anyway, they remember the initial instructions about attacking like they're actually fighting and launch themselves at our boy. Kang readies himself, with Jarvis promising to assist him by marking out the anticipated punches. With that, our guy easily ducks to avoid a swing from one thug. He then dodges the second punch as well, and when the thug tries to trip him, our boy just jumps over the attempt, saving himself once again. Jarvis then pinpoints the spot he's supposed to grab, and our boy promptly snatches the lackey up, swinging him into the air and delivering a barrage of punches. Once that guy is out of the picture, Kang jumps at the next thug and smashes him right over the head, leaving him crashing down to the ground. The last thug panics as he realizes our boy isn't following the script, and the director isn't calling for a cut either. Eventually the thug runs toward our boy, who ducks down with such flair you wouldn't believe it. He quickly delivers a head smash using his own head, then follows up with a solid knee strike right into the guy's belly. After that, he hits the thug with a stick like a baseball bat, and these moves leave the director's jaw on the floor. Not just him, but everyone watching is left in awe, while the poor guys who were playing villains have been dropped like flies. Kang wipes the sweat from his forehead after this epic moment, and promptly starts walking toward the heroine, who, let's be real, looks way more scared of our boy than she ever was of those thugs. He sticks to the script and promptly tells her that he's here to save her. But the actress is so panicked that she spouts some nonsense, asking if he's going to take her down as well. Finally, the director calls for a cut and starts yelling, reminding Kang that he was just supposed to act as if he was hitting them, not literally beat the hell out of these guys. He starts berating himself, saying he was so blinded to finish the movie that he didn't pay attention to what was really happening. But surprisingly, one of the actors playing the thug stands up quickly, leaving the director utterly confused since this dude was supposed to be knocked out cold. Eventually, all three thugs stand up, saying that even though our boy was hitting them, they didn't feel any pain at all. 
The director, not expecting this twist, has no clue how to react, while his secretary is yelling and shouting at our boy, asking what in the hell he's doing hitting people for real. He is so busy trying to downplay our boy that he doesn't even realize the thugs who just got beaten are absolutely fine and safe. Once he finally realizes, he goes silent, his face a picture of confusion. He quickly asks the trio if they're actually okay, to which they reply that they're not sure either, but one thing is for sure, it felt like there was a cushion or something, and it felt more like they were sliding than being hit. The assistant calls this bullshit while our guy tries to explain the science behind his punches, saying it's all like when you're sliding sideways on downhill skis. Of course, this still doesn't make any sense to the assistant, so he quickly turns to one of the actors and reminds him how when he got hit with the knee, his body flew up, so why he's not hurt at all. The guy just smiles and says he didn't feel anything. The knee just kind of slid over his body. But the assistant insists that their camera clearly filmed them getting beaten up, so how can it not hurt at all? Finally, the big cheese himself pops into the scene and decides to call it a day. He laughs loudly, claiming he knew all along that everything would turn out well which is why he didn't stop filming. But his crew knows he's just blatantly lying. They then decide to review the footage, and once they do, they're amazed at how everything played out perfectly. Even the reactions on everyone's faces are as realistic as they can get. What's even more concerning to the assistant is that our boy moved according to the camera positions. He calculated every camera angle and moved accordingly from start to finish to create the perfect scene. Kang then turns to the director, while the director is feeling over the moon right now, and asks if his part is over. The director responds positively, thanking him further and saying the scene looks just as good as a Hollywood action movie. With that, our boy is finally dismissed, and before he leaves, the other actor compliments him on his amazing acting. Meanwhile, the arrogant actress is still fuming as she is having a hard time swallowing the fact that my guy is actually a pro in acting. She believes these guys are just pretending it didn't hurt so they wouldn't have to reshoot the scene, and she can tell they're about to cry from the pain. It seems like she's just overthinking it a bit too much. She even thinks that if the script had told our boy to hit her, he would have knocked her out cold too. Our boy glances at the actress and shakes his head in acknowledgement, and this idiot woman starts freaking out, wondering if this creep is looking at him with lustful eyes. But suddenly, we realize he's not even glaring at her, but rather, he's looking behind her because Jarvis is reporting a strange noise coming from the wall. He then quickly looks up, and Jarvis identifies the source of the rattling noise, explaining that in a few moments, debris will fall from the ceiling. When the structure breaks, Fragments will fly toward the actors, and he has only five seconds to react. With no time to waste, our boy grabs the lead actor by the collar and throws him out of the way, which freaks the girl out even more. But with only three seconds left, he grabs her and starts dashing away. As the debris starts falling, he uses an iron rod to kick the debris away, all while the girl panics in his arms. Suddenly, Jarvis reports that a large structure is about to collapse. As the structure falls, a cloud of smoke erupts, leaving everyone with their jaws hanging wide open. They're calling out to her, asking if she's okay, begging her to be all right. Not surprisingly, she's quite alive in our boy's arms, but then she starts shouting again, begging for anyone to help her. Kang then asks her why she's overreacting like that. The lady wells up with tears and says he threw the main lead actor, and now he's trying to throw her too. My guy denies such intentions and reminds her that the set collapsed, so he had to save her and himself. The actress finally looks around and is even more shocked to see the entire set crumpled and wonders aloud what's going on here. Kang simply replies that he doesn't know either and adds that the set is just poorly constructed. She then glances at the lead actor and realizes that our boy actually saved her and the other actor from getting crushed by those steel bars. She starts to blush when she realizes that he's the one who actually saved her. He eventually sets her down not so gently. The other actor walks over to our boy, claiming that when Kang threw him, he almost thought our boy was holding a grudge against him. But even after being tossed aside, he claims he's totally okay. The director rushes toward his actors, Asking if they're all right, the lead actor flashes a thumbs up, saying he's fine, all thanks to Kang for saving them in an instant. The director turns to the lady, asking if she's okay too. She hesitates to admit it at first, but after glancing at him, she finally acknowledges he's not a bad guy after all, and admits that she's okay too. The director lets out a sigh of relief. If those steel bars had fallen on the actors, someone could have seriously gotten hurt, or worse. With the current drug scandal going on, he can't help but think that if an actor had died due to rushed set construction, his movie would have been doomed. In his eyes, our boy suddenly becomes a hero without a cape. I can't help but think that this fat director is only worried about his movie getting doomed instead of fearing for someone's life. The assistant then asks the director if they need to repair the set before they can film again. The director gets angry, asking if he's crazy, because if it collapses again after some quick fixes, who's going to be responsible? 
but the assistant reminds him how they are going to film the remaining scenes. Just then, the cameraman rushes in, saying they captured the whole scene perfectly. Both the director and the assistant turn to him, confused, asking what he means. The cameraman explains that he had the camera rolling for behind-the-scenes footage, and they caught the entire thing on tape. They play the footage and watch as our boy rescues the damsel in distress, blocking away those steel rods heading toward them. The director watches intently, and then he's absolutely shocked, wide-eyed as he asks who filmed this. The cameraman panics, thinking their senior might be angry, but contrary to that, the director is impressed to see that this footage is literally Hollywood-grade shit. He's in awe that they managed to capture a scene like this without even planning it. He starts to drool a little, imagining how huge this is going to be and how this scene will be remembered throughout history. But his assistant quickly bursts his bubble by reminding him that while this scene is too good to throw away, it's actually an accident, not a scripted moment. It'll be crazy if people find out it was a real accident, and they'll likely get a lot of hate for it. The director brushes it off, saying no one got hurt, and they can spin it for marketing. If any problems arise, they can just let the lawyers handle it. After a lot of back and forth, the director finally convinces his assistant. But then the assistant raises another concern, saying how they can use this shot without the consent of our boy. Without wasting a single moment, the director rushes over to our boy. His eyes become puppy innocent as he thanks him for saving both actors during the accident. Our guy just shrugs, saying he did what he had to do. The director calls him a hero for his deeds and quickly gets to the point about the footage. He reveals that they accidentally filmed the scene and it came out so well. He asks if they can use it in their movie, even promising to credit our boy in the end credits. Kang thinks for a moment, while Jarvis reminds him that if his face is plastered all over the public eye, it might interfere with their future missions. But once the director mentions they'll be paid for this scene, Jarvis quickly adds that since his face was covered, it shouldn't be a problem. With that, they both shake hands and seal the deal. Afterwards, we see Yoon Ha's manager asking if she's all right. She responds positively, but it's clear her mind is still preoccupied with thoughts of our boy. As she looks around, she notices he has been injured on his back. She quickly rushes over, asking if he's hurt since his shirt is torn. Kang brushes it off, saying it's nothing, as it's just a little ripped clothing. She then reflects on how she was almost crushed by a huge steel bar, but this boy saved both her and the other lead character, and he doesn't even have a scratch on him, which is just mind-boggling. Finally, she thanks him sincerely, and our boy replies that he was just doing his job to help out. But she quickly shifts back to her anger, reminding him that she's not a staff member, but an actor. My guy just says he knows as he was just trying to be funny. Anyhow, he dramatically adjusts his hat and declares that since his job here is done, he'll head back to the catering truck. With that, he strolls off, leaving the eager director praising him for his equally amazing food and acting skills. They then discuss what the boy actually does and the assistant mentions that he works at a PC cafe. They find it pretty odd that someone so talented works in a place like that. The lady asks if he won't be coming back after helping them today. The director eagerly responds that they are definitely going to ask him to help out tomorrow and the day after too, because with Kang on board, this movie is going to be the best action film ever. Yoon Ha laughs and claps, teasing the director that this movie was supposed to be a romantic comedy. The greedy director makes it clear that the genre doesn't matter. He insists that if they cut out all the scenes with that drug addict and replace them with action, they can solve all the problems piling up in front of them. The assistant annoyingly starts dialing up to call the stunt director, muttering how they are already running out of time. But the director interrupts him, reminding him that there's no need for anyone else because our boy is literally a one-man army who calculated all the movements in real time. All they desperately need is Kang. One of the crew members points out that Kang isn't even a recognized actor, but the director just brushes it off, reminding them that nobody gives a damn about acting license when my guy is literally better than the main lead Kim Yu chan The real main lead starts to tear up at hearing such a brutal truth from his senior. Meanwhile, the assistant then asks what they are going to do about the food truck since Kang is the one managing all the cooking since the original owner got hurt. The director gets visibly annoyed and snaps back, making it clear that he does not want to hear any more objections. He quickly rushes off to have a talk with our boy. Meanwhile, Kang strolls out of the set, he then points out how things started to fall right in the middle of shooting where the actor was standing, which makes this accident a bit too suspicious. Jarvis then states that after analyzing the visual data, there's a possibility that intentional damage was done before the collapse. Kang then wonders if someone could have tampered with the set beforehand to make this accident happen. Jarvis explains that multiple steel lights fell toward Shinun Ha, and anyone could have predicted her position just by looking at the script. It seems like someone might have targeted the actress or even the movie itself, maybe someone who wants it to fail. Just then, the director rushes over to our boy, asking if they can talk for a moment. My guy just raises an eyebrow, 
wondering if there's even anything left to discuss. The director starts crying, begging our boy to save his movie. Even after a lot of pleas from the director, my guy looks totally uninterested. He explains that he has work in Seoul and can't keep coming back here. But the director quickly reveals that, starting tomorrow, they're moving all the additional shooting to Seoul. Once again, my guy reminds him that he's still got work and can't be on set all day. The chubster quickly assures him not to worry, as he'll only be needed during the actual shooting. Jarvis quickly reminds him that this won't work since they've got to finish their mission at the temporary base. That's when the director leans in and whispers the juiciest part of this whole thing, saying he'll make sure our boy gets paid well, and that the production company isn't in a position to skimp on money right now. As soon as Jarvis hears the mention of money, he switches up his tone real quick, saying if a large amount of funds comes in, it might be a good idea to accept. With that, Kang agrees to the deal and casually asks for the schedule so he can show up. Afterward, the director, who had been slowed down by frustration, really starts to enjoy working again and regains his speed, showing his true skills as soon as our boy jumps in to help with the shooting. Though all the additional scenes at the collapsed set are canceled, a better scenario begins to take shape. By morning, actors and staff rush to film the movie, and by the afternoon, thanks to our boy's contribution, the atmosphere becomes calm and smooth. Suddenly a car pulls up at the set, and out pops Tho entertainment manager Kim. He quickly rushes toward the director, begging him to save his company. The manager frantically says that if they release this movie in its original form, they'll get nothing but complaints, and the movie will flop. He emphasizes that the entertainment company will be in serious trouble. They can't delay the release date because their company has already secured major theater slots using all their resources, and if that falls through, no one will be able to handle the aftermath. That's when the director puts his finger right over the scared manager's face and flashes a grin, assuring him that he has a solution for all these daunting problems. The frightened manager quickly asks how he plans to pull this off, because he wants to report the situation upstairs. In response, the director casually says he's just going to change the genre of the movie. Of course, this leaves the manager outraged, while the director just states that starting today, this movie is a romantic comedy and action flick. Kim's jaw drops further at this news as he reminds the chubby guy that they only have a week left for additional shooting and editing, so he has no clue how they're going to take care of all this mess. In response, the director assures him that they're working on the shooting right now, so they don't have time, but he promises to show him something during dinner later. Suddenly, someone slams the gate open, annoying the director, who quickly asks who has the audacity to do this. He's fed up with people slamming the door during the shoot, causing dust to fly everywhere. But the manager's face goes absolutely pale, and he literally starts bowing in front of this man, who is actually Lee Taeho, the boss and CEO of the entire entertainment company. Lee notices the chubby director and strides toward him, saying he didn't want to come here because he didn't want to put a burden on the shooting location. But he explains that an accident happened on set that caused the set to collapse, so there's no way he wouldn't check on it himself. Manager Kim stutters through his words, saying that the thing is there was a mistake while working. But the boss reminds him that it's precisely his job to prevent mistakes on set. Kim tries to argue that they've been busy because of that druggie, but the boss cuts him off with serious, bossy energy, asking how long he's going to keep blaming the druggie. That's when a little girl shows up in the scene, looking like she's the daughter of the CEO. She quickly asks her dad if he's angry once again. Her name is Lee Minji, and she's actually a child actress. The boss, who was just being all stern and bossy, instantly softens as he turns to this cheerful girl. He calmly assures her that he wasn't angry. He just had to speak loudly since the place is so noisy. Minji then turns to the director, and, since her dad isn't showing his stern side in front of her, he politely asks the director if he can finish all the reshoots and editing in a week, and he wants a clear answer. To this, the fatty confidently replies that it will be even better than the original. The boss just shrugs, saying that this is expected from a veteran director from Chungmuro, and he knows he'll do a great job. The director then explains that there's someone named Kang who is amazing at martial arts and has the ability to shoot Hollywood-level action scenes in one take. He assures him that if they get him on board, Kang can save this movie. The boss is surprised to hear this and claims he's never heard of anyone named Kang before. He starts to wonder if he's from abroad. He is feeling quite happy to see that even though the director has recruited him in a hurry, the guy turned out to be a gold mine. He then asks where this boy is right now. The director promptly walks his senior outside and points toward the food truck. As soon as the boss looks over, he's quite fascinated to see our boy over there. Cooking up rice with the full power of a seasoned chef, the boss is at a loss for words as he asks if that master over there cooking a large fried rice dish is the guy in question. The director happily states that this martial arts director Kang is definitely the guy, but the boss isn't sure why the martial arts director is working on a food truck, to which the director states that Kang drove the catering truck all the way here. This surprises the CEO, but not in a good way. He's annoyed, 
and asks if the director left the martial arts direction to the catering guy and even had him stand in for the lead actor's action scenes. The chubster heartily agrees, saying that Kang's body type is quite similar to Kim yu chans The boss starts berating the fatty, asking if he's trying to mess with him. He demands to know how, in this urgent situation, he's bringing in an amateur just to save some budget. The director's jaw drops at such a bold accusation, while the CEO continues, saying that since the director knows the film is doomed anyway, he's trying to pocket some extra cash by cutting corners. Their argument turns into a heated exchange, and onlookers begin to gather. The boss makes it clear that he needs to submit all the production expenses, not a cent off, and file them properly. With that, he leaves the scene, leaving the fatty shouting that this is all just a misunderstanding. But the boss nonchalantly tells his manager to gather all the receipts and verify every single detail. Later, we see Lee Minji holding some snacks that are definitely made by our boy, and she's absolutely blown away by the taste. She quickly asks what these snacks are called. Kang says they're called mixed snacks. The girl finds the name a bit weird, but the food itself is actually quite delicious. He then tells her that he made a lot for the staff, so she can eat as much as she wants. The girl gets teary-eyed when she claims that she can't eat too much because her mom won't let her have too many snacks, saying she'll gain weight. But Kang reminds her that she's just a child, so a little extra weight won't hurt at all. The little lady acts all nonchalant, claiming that she's actually the lead actor in this movie, so she needs to watch her figure. Our boy counters that she's still a child, but the girl insists that being a child actor doesn't change the fact that she's playing the lead role. She then asks if he can make these snacks again for her, to which our boy replies that he wishes he could, but starting tomorrow, they'll be filming in Seoul, so there won't be a catering truck. The girl looks kind of dejected and wonders aloud if she should take some now and hide them in her dad's car for later. But my guy advises her to just stop by the PC room where he works sometimes, and he can make them for her then. The girl lights up and pulls out her flip phone, telling him to give her his number so she can contact him later. She adds that she'll save his number as Snack Guy. We then see the director's assistant, who is trying to convince the CEO to just take a single look at the scene they shot. He's confident that the CEO will be pleased with the results, especially since the director is the one who chose our guy. Everyone knows how notorious it is to please the director. It looks like the boss is finally all ears to hear what this man is saying, and he twirls around, saying that he'll see what they shot. Once they reach the computer, the video plays, and the glory of our boy's acting nearly blinds everyone. The boss is left with his jaw hanging as he asks when they added CGI and how they choreographed the scene to get shots like this. That's when the director makes his classic comeback, stating that there was no time for CGI. This is the raw footage, completely unedited. Kang is actually the one who calculated every single angle to ensure he would be captured perfectly on camera and moved accordingly. The boss is having a hard time believing this, but the director insists that this is the truth. The CEO then asks if he's telling him that the amateur from the catering truck nailed it in one take without any cues and didn't even calculate where the big iron rods and lights would fall. To which the director responds that the set collapsed in reality, and Kang saved them in that moment of crisis. The boss finally facepalms himself, realizing he owes the director an apology for his earlier comments. He sincerely apologizes for that misunderstanding. The director just laughs, saying he's glad the CEO finally understands now. He is just glad that his senior finally bothered to watch the scene instead of being stubborn. The boss then decided to pay a personal visit to Kang. While our boy is cooking the same delicious snacks, the CEO approaches him. Without even listening to what this man is trying to say, my guy simply tries to hand him over the snacks, thinking he's a customer. But the director quickly states that he's not here for the snacks. He's actually President Lee Tae Ho of the entertainment company. He explains that since our boy saved his film, he came to thank him personally. But my guy just shrugs and says he was just doing his job, even though, let's be real, it was mostly for the money. The CEO then looks at the snacks and asks what they are, to which our boy simply tells him to just try it. At first, the CEO feels reluctant to take a bite because he had too much of that stuff during his military service, so he's not really a fan. However, he knows he has no choice but to eat them if he doesn't want to upset Kang. But as soon as he takes a bite, his reality shatters, and everything turns upside down for him. It's literally unbelievably delicious. It's sweet, it's salty, and it's savory all at once, with a slight pancake taste, but not greasy. The flavor is truly magical, and he's sure his daughter will absolutely love something like this. But Kang reminds him that Minji already came by and had some of this deliciousness by herself. While wiping off the tears of joy from his eyes, the father hopes that his daughter thanked our boy properly for the food. He waves his hand toward the crowd and calls out to his daughter, telling her to grab some snacks with him, but he doesn't get any response. A sense of gloom looms over him as he wonders where his daughter has gone. Kang then asks Jarvis if he knows anything about Minji, to which Jarvis replies that he couldn't locate her and can't find her in the recorded footage either. 
The boy wonders if she could be inside the building, but the system states that there is no sign of Minji's presence nearby. Suddenly, he gets a phone call from her, and the father asks how he knows his daughter's number. Kang responds that she exchanged numbers earlier to get more mixed snacks later. He then picks up the call, and as soon as he hears the caller, he goes into stunned silence, prompting the father to ask if he's alright. But my guy is just frozen in his place with his phone pressed to his ear, while the father keeps asking him why he suddenly looks so upset.